George Michel, who farmed in Lynn County, Iowa in the late 1930s, built a forage harvester of his own design based on a junked Model T Ford before such machines existed. When the Farm Journal reporter asked him how he came up with the idea, he replied, Try pitching silage just once and you will start to think about a machine to do the work. Ensiling is indeed a hard and labor-intensive job, but people do it because ensiling green fodder gives them the opportunity to solve an old and difficult problem. How to feed a herd of cattle in winter, in bad weather, or simply a poor harvest. According to one user, it was the only safe way of coping with drought and make the dairy industry independent of climate conditions. Compressing the summer's growth into small compass, canning it airtight, and preserving it indefinitely in a sweet, juicy, succulent condition is part of the secret of the silo's success. No other means will provide so much palatable and nutritious, digestible feed from one acre of land. The first silo is believed to have been built and filled in 1876 by Francis Morris. He built brick silos in his barn and introduced the practice of making corn silage to the United States. Since then, silos has been adopted by farmers and used with more or less success in practically every state in the Union. But the early years of this technology were not smooth. The imperfections of silos and preservation methods, as well as the machinery and equipment for harvesting, chopping, and loading silage crops were often the basis for arguments against the process. However, the adoption of silos was rapid, and just 30 years after Morris's first experiments, there were some 500,000 silos in the United States. In sections where livestock interests prevailed, they became almost as necessary on dairy farms as the cows themselves. The silo, as a storage place, has its own interesting and rich history of development, worthy of a separate story, which will probably appear on this channel soon, as well as forage harvesters. But this film will be dedicated to another important component of silage production, silage cutters, and silo fillers. In the early years of ensiling, all corn harvesting was done with a corn knife. It was modified to improve functionality, and in the late 1870s, a corn leg cutter was even patented, allowing the worker to bend less and harvest more acres per day. The cut greens were loaded by hand into wagons and hauled to the ensiling site. Subsequently, the forage harvesting process was mechanized, mainly through the use of modified existing machines, such as finger bar mowers and hay loaders, both horse and tractor drawn. The next step was special corn harvesters, consisting of finger mowers combined with loading conveyors. These machines did not chop the silage plants, but only cut them and loaded into transport wagons. Although already at this time, Inventors were attempting to add a chopping function to the technological process of a forage harvester, which will be discussed below. To obtain high-quality silage forage, it is not enough to simply remove the plants in the field and unload them into a tower silo or pit. The green mass in the silo must be compacted as much as possible to displace air from it, and then sealed. Only under such conditions the silage mass at a certain elevated temperature is fermented, as a result of which coarse plant tissues are digested and nutritious feed is formed. Otherwise, there will only be losses. For better trampling of green mass in the silo, the stems of plants should be chopped before filling. Proper cutting and filling are really quite as important as the silo itself. Saving labor and time is no less important, so special devices for cutting silage crops were needed. The first of these were hand lever cutters. Elmore W. Ross and his company of Springfield, Ohio, claimed to have built the first cutters in the United States especially for insulage. Founded in 1851, Ross built various fodder cutters for many years 
and produced more of them than any other manufacturer in the United States. At one time, Ross cutters, known for their high quality, were in use by over three quarters of the ancillowers of the United States. The Ross lever cutter could be purchased for $6, which is equivalent to about $189 today. The principle of operation of the device is simple. Corn stalks are manually fed from a chute under the knife to the desired cutting length. Then the lever is lowered manually and the knife cuts the desired length of stalk. Maintenance of the machine was limited to adjusting the gap between the knife and the counter shear plate, which was done by tightening special bolts and sharpening the cutter knives. Some models were equipped with the gauge plate for setting the desired cutting length. Meanwhile, the ensiling system was rapidly evolving and becoming firmly established. In the United States, there were six silos in 1880, 2000 in 1885, 3684 in 1886, and 6792 in 1887. At the same time, in England in 1880, there were four silos, in 1885 to 1183, in 1886 to 3561, in 1887 to 6119. No system was in use on farms in those days that produced as large a return for so small an outlay as insulich, a large saving in cost of feeding, great increase in milk and flesh, and improved manure. Now more productive insulage cutters were required. Manufacturers of agricultural machinery began to adapt dry fodders for these purposes, replacing the cutting mechanism. The E.W. Ross Company produced 12 standard sizes of dry fodder machines with a rotary cutting unit driven manually or mechanically, costing from $16 to $1,000. Five of them were specially adapted for insulage cutting. The Ross insisted that their machines, very strongly and heavily built, will cut a very much larger amount of any kind of fodder, green or dry, and run with less power than any machine in the world. This was based on hundreds of tests. They offered a reward of $1,000 for any cutter that will cut as much fodder, green or dry, and that will also do the work as well and with the same power. A farmer in Junction City, Kansas, reported that the little giant number 14A and Cartier he used, able to cut and elevate from 40 to 50 tons of corn each day. He cut his sheaf oats and elevated to barn loft. It saved threshing and made excellent feed. The carrier that the farmer is talking about is a device for loading chopped forage crops into silos or barn lofts. It was a chain and slack conveyor driven by the forage cutter mechanism. Early carriers consisted of only one section and their receiving hopper was located directly under the cutter's discharge chute. For this reason, they could not be raised at an angle steeper than 45 degrees, which limited the height at which the load could be lifted. In 1891, Elmore Ross patented a carrier consisting of two conveyors, a receiving and a loading one. This design allowed the loading conveyor to be installed at an angle of up to 80 degrees, although it became more complex. Subsequently, the design was simplified by other inventors, but with the inherited concept. Prominent Wisconsin farm equipment manufacturer Charles Silberzon, in partnership with what becomes the Gell Brothers Manufacturing Company, introduced their commercial cutter, later known as the Hexelbank Cutter, in 1889. It was a cylinder-type hand crank feed cutter used for cutting corn for livestock. The unique machine, priced at $11.50, was sold mostly in Wisconsin, but quickly found favor with dairy farmers in the rest of the United States. The development of mechanical insulage cutters led to the introduction of machines with self-feed tables and wind elevators. The self-feed table allows the cutter to eat green or dry forage with astonishing rapidity and with very little attention from the operator. It consisted of a hardwood frame and an endless apron sliding over it consisting of two steel chains to which hardwood slats were riveted. 
The chains ran over sprocket wheels secured on a separate shaft, which received power from the forage cutter mechanism. Another innovation of ensilage cutting machines was the wind elevator. The wind elevator consisted of a centrifugal fan, a six to nine inch diameter metal pipeline, and a silage distributor. When the cutter operated, the stalks of the plants were moved by the self-feed table and the feed rollers to the knives of the cutting mechanism. An additional auger fed the chopped green forage to a blower, where it was caught in the airflow created by the fan blades and moved through a pipeline to any height and in any direction. The silage distributor evenly directed the cut material inside the silo. 1910's Silberzon Ensilage Cutter No. 19 Special with a 19-inch knives rotary cutting device and provided with 12 to 15 horsepower, processed from 12 to 20 tons of raw material per hour. Silberzon patented a reversible gearbox for his new machine, which allowed the feed rollers to change direction if the cutting unit was clogged with coarse corn stalks. As can be seen from the figure, the first silage cutters of this type had a rather complex kinematic scheme, but over time their design was improved. Along with the blades, cutting knives began to be installed on the fan wheel. Thus the fan will simultaneously became the flywheel of the cutting apparatus, similar to a disc straw cutter. These cutters were called flywheel type. In the new technological scheme, the plant stems were fed whole into the blower body and crushed there. The rotary cutting apparatus was excluded, but the feed rollers were retained. Removing several units from the scheme reduced the energy consumption for friction in such machines. As a flywheel type, the advanced roomly type A silo fillers were built with a 16-inch throat a capacity of 15 to 18 tons per hour and a cutting length of one quarter, one half, and one inch. They required 20 to 30 horsepower with a flywheel speed of 550 to 850 RPM. All the gears of the machine were enclosed and ran in oil baths, and all moving parts were securely guarded by guards, thus ensuring maximum safety to the operator. One lever controlled the forward and reverse motion of the feed rollers. The flywheel was made of solid steel plate three quarters of an inch thick. The fan blades were made of steel plates and hot riveted to the flywheel. The knives were made of carefully selected solid steel three-eighths of an inch thick, with inlaid tool steel edges, and properly tempered to maintain the cutting edge. The knives were secured to the flywheel with two bolts. Each of the advanced roomly silo filler came with 30 feet of fan pipe and silage distributor. Demand created supply. Many manufacturers of farm machinery built insulage cutters that were driven first by hand, then by horses, steam, oil engines, and tractor flywheels. The change in their production capacity can be traced in the product line of the once well-known Joseph Dick Manufacturing Company of Canton, Ohio. The Joseph Dick Lever Feed Cutter cut green forage very well since its knife shape was made round but the capacity was directly dependent on the strength and endurance of the operator. The Alpine Cutter was specifically designed and constructed to meet the want of those in need of good feed cutter at a low price. The cutting capacity, in addition to the strength of the operator, also depended on the cutting length which could be 5 sixteenths, 1 half, 5 eighths, 7 eighths, and 1 and a half inches. The flywheel type famous number 2B and famous number 3C hand power cutter all also had productivity dependent on the human factor, the selected cutting length, and the technical condition of the machine. The famous number 4D hand and power feed cutter could be operated by one or two operators with two cranks installed or by mechanical power. The power required was from one to two horsepower. When run by power, the capacity was from 1,500 to 2,000 pounds per hour, varying according to speed, type of material, and length of cut. The cutter could operate at a speed of 700 to 800 revolutions per minute. The famous number 5E hand and power feed cutter was the same as the previous one, but larger and capable of producing green feed from 2,000 to 2,500 pounds per hour. The famous number 6F was a power cutter neck size larger than the 5E, 
but much heavier and wider cut. It could cut from 2,500 to 3,000 pounds per hour. The number 7G had three 16 and a half inch long knives instead of the two of the previous model and was equipped with a self-feed table, so it would cut from 3,000 to 5,000 pounds per hour. Speed from 650 to 700 per minute. Power required from four to five horsepower. And finally, the Blizzard Insulage Cutter in several sizes, with the self-feed table and the wind elevator. These machines have operated at capacities from 8,800 to 33,000 pounds per hour.